Well, thank you, first of all, for coming to this extremely timely event around nature restoration um, and how it should, should sow the seeds for the EU's economic resilience and competitiveness in the future. And today I'm delighted to have a panel of businesses and other experts that can explain a bit more why, in fact, nature restoration is a critical framework uh, for the future. Um, I'd like to thank um, the co-hosts we have today, uh, which is MEP César Luena and MEP Confin, who is on his way. Um, and I'd also like to thank their, their offices also for all the work they've done, because, of course, it's always a, a lot of work for the, the MEP offices. So just to introduce myself, my name is uh, Ursula Woodburn. I'm the director of the Corporate Leaders Group Europe. Um, we have members of, who are industry leaders from a range of sectors across energy, infrastructure, retail, consumer goods, finance, and the, and the built environment, who are really committed to playing a leadership role to secure an equitable transition to the net zero nature positive economy. And we have a decade-long strategic partnership with the Green Growth Group of Member States and with MEPs under the Green Growth Partnership. I'd also like to say we are grateful for the support of many partners in putting on this event, including the We Mean Business Coalition, which is a global non-profit coalition working with thousands of the world's leading businesses to take action on climate change. Now, as we heard, this, as I said at the beginning, this is a very timely event. Uh, we are at the moment um, in the, the last year of this commission, um, where, which has been really leading on the European Green Deal, which set out how to make Europe the first climate neutral continent by, by 2050, to show real the a clear direction to businesses in terms of setting their own climate and energy transition ambitions to accelerate the transition and keep what the 1.5 objective alive. And I think this is one of the, the core elements of the, the Green Deal is the, that could become the framework legislation which allows the EU to implement the international agreement it just agreed in Montreal, the, Mont the, can, the Montreal Biodiversity Framework. So today, we'd love to discuss further what the next steps are for this law. We heard from Executive Vice President Timmermans in the Agri-Environment Committees this week. He underlined that we need to negotiate and finalise this legislation. I think, I think we're all in, in favour of that here. The need to have resilience in, of our economy for food security and to give a clear policy direction to businesses and farmers about how to align our climate, nature and energy objectives. Um, yeah, I mean, unfortunately, I think the Agri and uh, Pesh Committee have rejected the, the report at the moment, but we really look forward to seeing how we can negotiate a, a way forward on this key legislation. Uh, before taking too much time, um, I'm delighted to welcome MEP Pascal Confin, who you all know well. He's the, the chair of the Environment Committee to, uh, perhaps I could, if, or if you like, I can give you a minute to sit down. I, <laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> to share your reflections um, about the, the current state of play and the importance of, of this uh, legislation. Okay, uh, so I'm very glad to, to be here with you and together with uh, César uh, Luena, uh, who is uh, having, of course, a very uh, important role in that uh, nature restoration uh, law uh, debate and uh, hopefully positive conclusion. Um, so, uh, we, what is, first what strikes me is that on the uh, mobility, energy, industrial part of the Green Deal, we have managed to find wide agreement, including with the business community, or at least a majority of the business community, uh, to go uh, fast and to change the rules. And that's why we have been doing the carbon market reform, the standards for CO2 for cars, and so on, and so on, and so on, and you know, you know that by heart. <clears throat> and we do it in 90% uh, of the cases with the support of EPP. Mm -hmm. So wide consensus. And I consider that it is very important to have it stable. Because the worst case scenario for you, for investors, is unstable rules. Then uh, for three years, you go very progressive, and then the next three years, you go very conservative, and at the end of the day, what about your investment and stability? By the way, it's one of the main risks of IRA. I don't know what will happen next year uh, to the IRA. Uh, in the ca in case Biden does not uh, win the uh, election. Uh, in Europe, 
except on agriculture, we have managed to have a depolarized debate. On agriculture, we haven't managed to have it so far. And that's the key problem. The key problem is there. Because once it is polarized, it is politicized, and then, of course, everybody says, including things that are definitely not in the test. Uh, I heard that uh, uh, we will not be able uh, to have more solar panels or wind power turbines because of this law, which is completely fake and wrong because there are three articles explicitly referring to this case and excluding from the scope of this regulation uh, renewable energies and all, everything related to that. So uh, we need to create more consensus. And in order to get there, we need to align economics, ration, economic rationality and logics and climate and biodiversity arguments. And that's why you have a key role to play. That's why you have a key role mm -hmm. to play. Because we collectively manage to do it, again, as I said, regarding mobility, energy. On the energy, you still have the hot potato of nuclear, but if you look at the big picture, it's one element among many others where we all agree, and uh, on, uh, on uh, industry. So we need you to create the economic narrative that protecting nature, protecting ecosystem, having more resilience for climate shock, and so on, and so on, and so on, is good for yield, is good for food security, is good for your business, is good for the value chain, and so on, and so on, and so on. So we need you to help us to design this, that which is at the core, if I take my Renew hat for a second, which is at the core of the Renew uh, approach, but I think mm -hmm. does, not put, uh, does not cause any problem to say that. Uh, then, uh, second, uh, we need to also to have support for this huge stake, which is protecting nature, restoring biodiversity, and so on, so on, not only to target regulations that are themselves targeting farmers. It's very important. Otherwise, the farmers have the feeling that, okay, you are ask, asking me things mm -hmm. that I cannot translate into my business contracts because uh, the Danone, the Unilever, the Nestle the, uh, of this uh, world and of Europe are not submitted to, the, this, to this rule. So that's why I have uh, been advocating for months now for an equivalent of ETS for the food sector, because we need to create a carbon slash biodiversity price paid by the companies investing in the restoration. So if they invest, of course, they don't pay. But then the business case is there, including for farmers. And that's why we have been supporting as well a lot of the uh, carbon farming uh, text, which is creating precisely the, the key credits for tomorrow and an equivalent of ETS for the food sector. And then for farmers, it will be way easier to accept the constraints because they would say, okay, this is on the whole value chain and I can have a return on this mm -hmm. because my clients will have to comply also with this rule. So that's where we are. Uh, I think we need to really uh, work together to design, uh, not only to discuss about the details, but to design the way the Green Deal could create uh, 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 more convergence regarding economy slash biodiversity slash climate on the uh, uh, agriculture dimension. Uh, and uh, again, uh, we need you, we need you for this. And very short term, very short term, we need you to support uh, the nature restoration law. We have concerns as well. Uh, when I say we, I take again my Renew hat. Uh, uh, we are negotiating this uh, with César. Uh, we will probably slightly change the, 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 the text as it is today. I take one example, uh, the Montreal uh, Agreement. I mean, we all signed up to the Montreal Agreement in December, but the law came before, the proposal came before the Montreal Agreement. So the Montreal Agreement, which is 30% of degraded land has to be restored by 2030, 
is not even stated in this law. And there is another objective. So I think we should be very clear. I mean, basic, we apply the Montreal Agreement. We do not apply something else. The full uh, Montreal Agreement and only the Montreal Agreement. And that's where we could uh, have probably more support uh, to uh, this law, at least uh, starting with the uh, renew. So uh, if you have uh, questions, uh, of course, I'm happy to answer. But that's the main uh, analysis I wanted to share with you today. Thank you so much, um, MEP Confirm. Well, on that note, perhaps it's time to, to pass to MEP Nuena, who is uh, the rapporteur for the Nature Restoration Law. Um, and who has worked on biodiversity for a lot of your career in the Parliament, so a real expert on the topic. Um, we'd be delighted to hear from you, your thoughts on where we are, the key elements you, you are working on and so forth. So thank you for joining us. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, you, and thank you all for coming. And um, thank you, Pascal, for your work and for your support in this month. Monsieur le Président. Um, the EU is at... Uh, critical point, really, facing um, unprecedented environmental challenges. 81% of the protected habitats in the EU are in poor condition. More than 70% of the soils are in an unhealthy state and 71% uh, of fish species in decline since uh, the last decade. This number, I think, is uh, no for you. Then we have the uh, opportunity to tackle the biodiversity crisis and become the world's leaders towards binding restoration targets. It is the first time in 70 years, 70 years of European integration that uh, we are regulating nature in its entirety. We are reaching the end of the negotiations and uh, approaching the voting in two, three, four weeks of the report at the uh, MB committee. As a reporter, I have included the concerns and compromises of different political groups, also PP group, even PP group, and also agri committee, also PES committee, and uh, also different economic sectors and different civil uh, society organizations. This regulation I think is necessary and benefits all. It is time to debunk all the myths and the fakes, really, generated around this regulation, as natural restoration will make our soils more fertile, will help pollinators to grow again, and help our ecosystems become more resilient to the effects of climate change. This is the truth. Citizens will, will benefit from it, farmers and fishermen will benefit from it, companies will benefit from it. Repeat, this is the truth in relation with the natural restoration law. There are uh, many positive outcomes coming from uh, implementing a strong binding natural restoration law. If we fail to act now, we put our ecosystems at the risk of disappearance and expose ourselves to the worst consequences of climate change. We need to protect pollinators, use close to natural practices in our forests, ensure the protections of marine life, and let our rivers flow freely. Our species, our ecosystems, our water bodies are essential to a healthy and climate resilient Europe. We cannot continue talking about restoring nature as if it's an option. We need it for our survival, for our well-being, and for our economies. Also, this is true. While we can see oppositions from certain, uh, certain groups and sectors, the reality is that many companies, business networks, and civil society organizations have publicly supported the proposal for a strong natural restoration law. They support the natural regulation proposal because it helps sustain jobs, because all sectors rely uh, on healthy ecosystems, and because it ensures long-term food and water security. It is clearly, uh, clearly stated that, together with climate change, the biodiversity crisis is putting human livelihoods and the foundations of economic activities at risk. 
they claim in their statement, uh, nature is our business, our future, our life. In other words, there is no business, no future, no life without nature. Um, for this, we must act now. Tomorrow will be too late. Thank you for your uh, support for coming here. And uh, I tell you one last thing. We, we uh, have a lot of difficulties with this uh, file in Agri Committee and Pest Committee, but also in MB Committee. But I am optimistic. We have a chance to pass, to approve the draft in the next MB Committee and also in the plenary. We are several groups that we are supporting and we are working a big deal yeah, in front of this, we have a specific strategy, especially of PP, especially of Manfred Weber, put his name in your papers. This is the guilty, Manfred Weber, who is changing the strategy, really who is broken the deal with liberals, with s and at the first of the mandate. And we approve the European Green Deal, and Weber is broken this deal, his own word, against Ursula von der Leyen. Put also this, because this is the, the real things that we are living in this house now. I see uh, some people smile in the room. I think this is, this is good, because the truth is the truth. But despite of this, maybe we could have numbers to pass this file. Maybe couldn't. I don't know. The Greens is in, uh, are in board. The left are in board. A big part, thanks to Soraya, thanks especially to Pascal Canfant, of Liberals are in board. The Socialists are in board. You never know. The, the, the enemies are very strong, but we are also very strong. Thank you. Thank you, Emmy Pilo, and for that, um, you know, strong call to support nature, and for, and also thank you for for mentioning the work that we've also done to help shepherd a number of organisations that support the law in a in a recent letter. Um, I think we have our, our final keynote today is is from Stefania Avantini, who's the director of One Planet Business for Biodiversity, which is a unique international cross sectoral and action oriented business coalition on biodiversity with a specific focus on agriculture, and initiated by uh, Macron um, a few years ago. So, um, Stefania, it would be great to hear from you a bit more from the business perspective. So, globally, what, what are the business practices and perspectives on the role of nature to build a resilient economy? We've just heard a lot of people talking about how businesses support this, but perhaps you could tell us a bit more your, your perspective on the matter. Thank yeah. you, Stefania. Thank you for inviting me. So effectively, I, I do represent a, co a coalition of wide businesses from farmer cooperatives to food manufacturer to textile and beauty care and retailers who have, who have understood their dependencies on nature. And they have not understood it today, they have understood it quite a few years ago. But I am here to tell a couple of facts also. What, what are these companies doing and why they actually are also calling for a strong nature restoration law? First, as I said before, we are really in, in crisis. The biodiversity, the climate crisis, and our agricultural system model today is in crisis. It cannot, the business as usual cannot work anymore. What I can say is, and, and, and companies and farmers have also understood it, our agricultural, our agriculture depends and relies on, on nature. We need those ecosystem services that they provide. And I want to give you also some facts you, uh, that you were telling. For example, one of our members, McCain, today is telling us that like five, five to ten years ago, one out of five years was a poor year, and this is how the banks would give them credit. Today, one of the five years is a good year. And this is due to extreme weather events. They, have, they are witnessing for the past four years a decrease in yield from 6 to 10 percent. They have did, did soil sampling in all their farms in, in, in France, 160 of them. The three quarters, more than the majority of them, are, uh, have shown so, uh, signs of soil degradation. 
So we can really see that, one, our, so our soils are in poor condition. This is affecting farmers' yield, and this is affecting so farmers' resilience and also the business resilience. These companies have all taken strong commitment to invest in a new agricultural model that works with nature. And the first reason why is this is the resilience of their business. So this is, this is critical, and this is why so, so many large companies are working on it today. And um, if I, I may, if, another argument that I want to, to make a link to the soil health law, to the nature restoration law, which is important, is science tells us that nature restoration will bring more resilience, and more importantly, that ecosystem collapses if we don't have uh, a minimum 10% of natural to semi-natural habitat per square kilometer. So we're talking about those hedges, those trees, those allies, those ecological corridors around the fields that are needed for the pollinators uh, and, and natural pest control habitat. And this is, a, this is a key and important factor, and this is why uh, businesses and farmers are actually taking action and are regenerating soils and restoring nature. And to give you a few, few more also positive examples of what is happening, um, First, I, I wanted to acknowledge the, the importance of, uh, like, there are three important steps that I think companies are taking today where they're advancing and progressive and where they, of course, can do more. One is how can we halt deforestation and so really commit to zero deforestation, zero, no further land conversion. This is really in line with science-based target network um, preliminary uh, targets that were published in 2021. The second one, which action is about really how can we regenerate soil health and support farming livelihoods there. This is the second very important point and, and, and in our coalition companies have all taken strong commitments to really scale up regenerative agriculture. Uh, I'll, I'll give, for example, a few examples. I was talking about McCain as a potato uh, company. <coughs> they have committed by 2030, 100% of their potato acreage will, will have implemented regenerative farming practices. Um, another example could be a Danone in France has committed by 2025 that 100% of their key ingredients will be sourced regeneratively. PepsiCo has committed to invest uh, 7 million acres in, in regenerative agriculture. So I just wanted to give those, the PepsiCo, Unilever, and Danone, and I, I won't cite Nestle because he will talk about it later. They have all taken very strong commitments to shift the way farmer, and to support farmers in the transition so that agriculture and nature can work together. Uh, so this is an important one. And the third point, which is about not only regenerating soil, but also by restoring nature and restoring degraded land. And here, maybe one, another important example I wanted to cite, even in the wine yards, where we know how, how expensive land is, uh, Maison like Moenessi and so NSC, they have actually, uh, they, they started to invest and, and committed to plant over a thousand square kilometers of hedges and trees and alleys in the Cognac region. This means taking out wine, wine and, and putting those hedges and trees, and, and, and you know how much this, this costs for them. And, and the reason why they're doing, doing it is because there is an economic benefit. So they've understood that the, that, uh, that the nature will bring the climate resilience that they need to extreme weather events. So this is why, as, as a coalition, uh, we support uh, the nature restoration law. Businesses, for sure, need a fair playing field. So this is, this is very important. And I also want to, wanted to uh, finish by saying we really need to support farmers in the transition. And so we are also advocating today f the risk of the transition is, is the short term risk of the transition is way too much on the shoulders of the farmers. And so there is a real need to de-risk farmers transition with new financial instruments, public private partnerships, new funding uh, also uh, on top of the one that is available. This is important and, and I can cite also there are a few studies out there from Wageningen University, uh, a, a late, latest one from BCG. We are publishing also one tonight that is really showing, showcasing that there is a, a a long-term economic, positive economic case. After the gap, the transition years, which of course for a, for a farmer be, be a risk of a, of, a, of a yield drop or of, of a higher cost, we see uh, studies show that there is up to 120 percent um, increase in profitability for farmers. So we're talking about a, a, business, a positive business case for an agricultural model that farms with nature and not against nature. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Stefania. I don't know, I mean, I know we're running slightly over time, but if you had a, if you had a quick comment to MEP Luena or MEP uh, Confirm, and then perhaps I'll invite you to, 
to head down and, uh, and the, pan the panelists for the next session to join. But I don't know if you have a quick comment before you head out. <laughs> Questions? <laughs> Support. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, call, we, call, no. call Manfred Weber, please. We have, no, I, I, I mean, I mean, I was ex yeah. ready about to say the, more or less the equivalent. Reach out to people here in this house. Yeah. I mean, don't keep it f exactly as you said. To reach out to EPP members, to renew members. Uh, I guess uh, it's less uh, useful for Green and, 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 and Socialist MEPs, but reach out to them because we, we can win. I mean, we can win this battle. Uh, I'm not saying we will win this battle, <laughs> but we are close to win this battle, okay? Because we know that part of the EPP is not sharing the idea that everything should be uh, thrown away. So Thank that's you. why we can win this battle, but we need you very short term. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, there was one quick question. I can only take one, I think, but sorry, did you have one over here? Can you introduce yourself, please? Sure. Uh, is working. Uh, my name is Luis Guillot. I'm a reporter for Politico and I've been covering the nature restoration regulation. And so I have um, one quick question for, for HMEP uh, to Mr. Confin. Uh, I, I'm wondering whether you've, you've given up on trying to find a common and unified position for, for the Renew Group on this, on this file. And to Mr. Luena, um, how do you intend to, to bring the EPP back uh, on the table of, of, of the negotiation, considering that both the, the AGRI and the PESH committee have clearly called to reject, to reject the proposal. Thank you. So for, for a very political uh, question, sorry for that. Uh, so we are working, so I haven't given up, as you said, uh, but on the contrary, we have launched a process decided yesterday within the uh, NV team of Renew uh, to go as uh, united as possible. Uh, so this will go up to next Tuesday, where you have your final uh, negotiating meeting, mm -hmm. and where we will come back to César with concrete uh, requests from Renew that will bring us to be able to support and then to win at the end. Um, if I knew this answer, <laughs> the things will be <laughs> very nice. I think uh, we need um, first to uh, consolidate our positions in the block of negotiation. Left, green, S&D, renew. And after that, I think... Uh, Mm, we are in, in other hands, really, in the hands of a fight inside PP, European PP, between Ursula von der Leyen, no, better, better between Manfred Weber and Ursula von der Leyen, that I think is passive fighter eh? in, this, in this cause. And I think we, um, we deserve a conversation, a negotiation between them, both of them. Because we are in the table, many files. And I am ready, and I read this, these days, that other politicians of different political groups, uh, leaders, real leaders of the European Union, like President Macron, and said, uh, maybe we need a more a slowly work, a slowly read, sorry for my vocabulary in English, um, with the European Green Deal. Okay, good. Then put in the table, or on the table, the files. And we have soils, we have pesticides, we have uh, genomic techniques, etc., etc. We have not the restoration law. What is the priority? I think, not, not for me. But I think with um, objective, with a neutral vision, I think the priority is the restoration, the nature, the biodiversity, the ecosystems. Then maybe it's a solution, a negotiation inside the PP and a conversation about, okay, but what the files are priority. I think this. 
and I think it's all. Okay, well, thank you very much. Um, I think we should uh, now end this part of the discussion now and move to the panel. I'd like to thank all the panelists so much for joining us. Thank you. And, um, and uh, I'd like to invite the, um, we try. the, 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 the next thank speakers you. to join us up, at the, up front, please. Thank you. And I also note there are some sandwiches in the room. If you're starving, you know, perhaps you can uh, pick one up as Enjoy. we speak. You know, not all at once, maybe, you know, but uh, just to, there are some sandwiches and some. And uh, thank you so much. Yeah. So the next part that we're moving to is uh, the panel discussion on addressing today's climate, nature and energy poly crisis to build a resilient European economy. We have just noticed the importance of food, as everybody has run for the sandwiches. But uh, they, you know, I think we can uh, just gently settle down on the panel and be, uh, be, uh, be uh, ready to... Hold on. <laughs> okay. So we'll just wait for the, the panelists to settle down. I think we've got a really exciting mixture of panelists um, from the, the Commission to a number of different uh, leading businesses, but also um, associations and, and, a, and, a, and an NGO, BirdLife, who's been working very uh, hard on this topic, as we can imagine. Um, so clearly, um, the nature restoration law is a key element of the Green Deal which calls for binding targets to restore degraded ecosystems. Um, and it could also build up Europe's resilience and strategic autonomy, preventing natural disasters and reducing risk to food security. So I think um, in a minute, or um, Carolina, when you, you've settled in, thank you so much for joining us. Carolina de Cunha is the, the Deputy Head of Unit for Natural Capital and Ecosystem Health from DG Environment. So Carolina, um, uh, if you could uh, present the Commission's proposal, but also the, the climate and economic benefits of nature restoration, because, you know, we've been hearing from a lot of businesses that really believe uh, or, or, or concede um, the importance of dealing this with this, also to reduce risks in the longer term. But, I mean, it would be great to hear from you, Carolina, on your perspectives of this. I hope you, yeah, is that okay if you got the, yeah. Yes, sure. Thank you very much. Can you hear me well? I also feel I'm a bit low compared to Ariel here, but uh, I try to straighten up. Um, so yes, uh, indeed, uh, it's a very timely meeting with the, the recent news from the, the two committees, but uh, of course we're going on and we're looking very anxiously at what uh, the ENVY committee will say uh, very soon, and then of course the plenary. So um, this nature restoration law that um, we proposed almost a year ago in June 2022 is indeed a, a groundbreaking proposal that uh, um, the Commission managed to, to put forward uh, to protect, but mainly to restore nature. And as already said, it's uh, one of the key deliverables under the biodiversity strategy, but also under the European Green Deal. And the aim, of course, uh, of this proposal is to stop and to reverse the, the alarming decline uh, in biodiversity. Um, and it has a very important component, uh, and that is the climate change aspect, where um, all these targets and goals uh, of the nature restoration law are also uh, crucial to enhance climate mitigation and adaptation. Uh, because nature stores large amounts of carbon and uh, we need it basically to, to meet other objectives. So why did we propose it? Uh, Cesar already said why we did it. Uh, I think we are all aware uh, nature in Europe is not doing well. It's in bad state and it's deteriorating. It's been deteriorating for many decades and, uh, and there's a, a plethora of studies that uh, confirm this uh, fact. Um, one could ask why does it actually matter, especially those who are not particularly nature lovers? Um, do I need nature? Well, yes, I think we are all very well aware now, especially after this morning, uh, that restoring nature is not only for the sake of nature itself. It is basically for our own survival on this beautiful planet, and it is essential for the economy. Without nature, 
we will not exist, we're part of it. Um, so it's, uh, I think it's a rather rhetorical question these days, I hope. Um, now we need, of course, nature for uh, the functioning of, um, of the society of the economy, um, because nature provides innumerable ecosystem services for free, theoretically, but I think we will all start paying the price uh, for these services once uh, the state of nature deteriorates further. So what we, did we actually propose in that law? Uh, you probably are familiar with it, but just very, very briefly, we set ambitious targets for nature restoration in our view, and I think the votes today confirm that they're um, quite ambitious to at least some. Um, we are proposing an overarching objective um, on nature restoration, so 20% of land and sea by 2030 needs to be restored, and then uh, all ecosystems in need of restoration 2050. That is uh, a slightly different target than that, than later on agreed uh, in Montreal, but um, th th they have a different construction, so they're not directly comparable, but I think ambition-wise, they are um, probably uh, comparable. Um, and then we propose specific targets for a range of ecosystems. So for um, agricultural ecosystems, for forest ecosystems, urban, uh, we propose targets for rivers, uh, targets for marine ecosystems. Um, also specific targets for pollinators. Um, so uh, there are different types of targets um, in the law, um, but it has a lot of... Um, flexibility for member states to actually decide where to put restoration measures, when and what kind of restoration measures they are supposed to, to implement, as long as they meet certain uh, requirements, such as, for instance, achieve a positive trend on a number of key biodiversity indicators, such as, I don't know, deadwood or bird index, etc. So member states will then be required to adopt national restoration plans, and uh, these are very important documents because they will uh, set out where uh, the restoration will take place, uh, what are the planned restoration measures, uh, what are the intended means of financing those measures, um, the expected benefits and co-benefits, especially in terms of climate change mitigation and adaptation, um, they will also have to specify a number of other things. Um, importantly, maybe uh, to mention, uh, they have to be coordinated with the designation of so-called, now they're called acceleration areas for renewables. So a, lot, a number of different uh, aspects have to be considered in those um, national restoration plans. Um, and then, um, again, I would like to underline that this law is not something unique, well, it is unique at the moment, but we already have a target also adopted globally, and it's an ambitious target. So if we don't have the nature restoration law, um, it would be very difficult for the EU to report on that <coughs> target, to monitor progress, to track progress, and uh, also to deliver, basically, on that global target. And it's not a target for the EU, the, 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 the target that was agreed in, in Montreal. Each and every member state has to also deliver on that target. So um, I think uh, that it's very clear that the nature restoration law will help with that. Now, specifically on the costs and benefits, as I was asked to refer a little bit to the impact assessment, maybe it's not the most exciting part of today's discussion, so I will uh, go quickly through that. But before I go into the actual proposal, just to recall uh, that uh, very famous number, I think already now, um, uh, the report of the World Economic Forum uh, is quoted very often by um, my bosses, by uh, uh, policymakers, that say that more than half of global GDP is heavily or moderately dependent on nature and its service. It's half of the GDP. So if we close nature, we close the economy. Um, there's a lot uh, that can be gained, a lot of uh, uh, benefits, investment opportunities in very different areas uh, where, where restoration can take place, several were mentioned already today, organic farming, agroecology, 
sustainable forestry, ecotourism, integrating nature-based solutions in green infrastructure in urban areas. Um, these uh, economic uh, activities are picking up and there is uh, a lot of business opportunities. There are a lot of business opportunities there. Now, specifically on the proposal, which uh, of course sets very concrete targets for member states, um, we uh, had to measure the cost and benefits uh, of those uh, uh, concrete targets within the time frames proposed, and uh, we made a calculation on those, uh, which very clearly demonstrated that uh, there are multiple benefits from restoring nature, and they by far outweigh the costs. So it is an investment in the sustainable future. There will be costs, but the benefits are much higher. And they result from the improvement of um, the, well, the improvement of, of conditions of ecosystems will then result in um, much uh, higher yield of those uh, ecosystem services. So re reducing um, pollution, temperature, climate change mitigation, adaptation, uh, better soil quality, et cetera, et cetera. Um, just to give you a very quick number uh, from the uh, impact assessment, uh, we um, had the best data on the ecosystems for which we set the targets, um, which are already covered by so-called Annex 1 of the Habitats Directive. There are different types of targets. I'm not going to go into that, but estimating benefits on those and focusing on carbon benefits alone already gives a figure of benefits in the order of 1,800 billion euro uh, with the cost of 154 billion euro. So it's basically a ratio of benefit to cost being eight to one. So it makes a lot of sense to invest. Um, the climate targets and the carbon benefits are also very important uh, from the restoration that was planned under this law, uh, we could sequester um, in the order of magnitude uh, an equivalent of annual greenhouse gas emissions of Spain or uh, annual combined emissions of the Benelux countries. So this is the annual saving that would result from um, this. And if these big figures don't speak to you, um, they kind of maybe a little bit hypothetical and high level, I always uh, like to quote uh, this number, uh, this example of one single tree. A young healthy tree um, has the net cooling effect that is equivalent to 10 average sized air conditioners operating 20 hours per day. So that's just one tree. I think that is something very easily um, imaginable. Yes. Um, that speaks to, uh, to the mind. So just one last perspective, the cost um, per citizen uh, that came out from our impact assessment of um, implementing this law uh, was around 14 euros per year. So I will leave you with these numbers um, and a discussion of whether thank you. it's worth it. Yeah, thank you so much, Carolina. Some really striking numbers, both in terms of impacts um, more broadly and to, to people. Um, thank you so much for your patience. I think the next person we're bringing in is Tim Christofferson, who's been patiently um, waiting online. Um, so Tim is, is the Vice President of Climate Action at Salesforce. So our question to you is really about your strategy to, to boost private sector support for nature conservation and restoration. And and it would be great to understand why you as a, as a, as a software company, why this, this matters so much to you. And just to note that, you know, I know we started a little bit late. So I think we've, if everybody could keep to around five minutes to allow some time for questions, that would be ideal. But thank you so much, Tim. And, and hopefully we can hear you. Go ahead. Let's see if this works. Thank you. And uh, thanks to CLG ah, for organizing this timely meeting. So Salesforce, for those of you who don't know, um, Salesforce, we're a leading provider of cloud software applications. We help um, companies of every size globally with their customer relationship management based on power of automation, artificial intelligence, real-time data, and flexible work. We have a global community um, driven by shared core values. So we're 
more than a business. We see ourselves as a platform for change. We're operating in Europe since 2000 and currently have about 10,000 staff in the EU with offices in, in 12 member states. Salesforce has been on the sustainability journey for over a decade. Um, it's one of our core values alongside trust, customer success, innovation, and equality. We reached um, 700 million US dollars in all-time philanthropic giving this year. And last month, we launched a comprehensive nature positive strategy as a new addition to our climate action plan and in response to the global biodiversity framework. We're now discussing with many of our large customers in the US, in Europe, um, how they can emulate that strategic and comprehensive way of a nature strategy, for example, in the Trillion Trees Initiative with World Economic Forum and 82 other companies. We're aligning how we can best invest more funding into nature and specifically forest conservation and restoration. And here I'd like to uh, quote two other facts from this study that Carolina mentioned. Um, if we shift the economy from a economy where we degrade ecosystems to one where we restore, so a nature positive economy that is estimated to generate 395 million new jobs, $10 trillion in new value globally by 2030. And uh, the UN Environment Program estimates that each euro spent on nature restoration can generate up to 30 euros in return for economies. So why is Salesforce engaging on nature? So first of all, um, most data centers rely on freshwater ecosystems for their cooling. So there's a very direct um, impact for technology companies, but more importantly for Salesforce, we would like to support the more than half of our 150,000 corporate customers globally for whom nature will be a material issue. So either for their supply chains or for upstream, upstream or, or downstream risks. So um, we lead with our nature positive strategy by example, we've done a TNFD based assessment of our own nature impact and dependencies as the task force on nature related financial disclosures. And we've supported conservation and restoration uh, globally, for example, through a $100 million ecosystem restoration and climate justice fund that we launched in 2021. We've also committed to conserve, restore, and grow 100 million trees by 2030, and we support tens of thousands of our customers on their net zero and nature positive journey, including with our technology. So we're very excited that the EU can become a global leader in restoration in response to the global biodiversity framework because nature restoration is quickly becoming a multi-billion euro global market and business. So let's recall that even just as at COP15, we saw the launch of 1.5 billion euros worth of new nature-based investment funds. These are commercial investment funds and many new ones have been added in the past months, partly for carbon credit generation, but many also for regenerative um, agriculture. I know we're short on time, so let's uh, maybe just like to close on a, on a personal note, because in addition to being the vice president at a global software company, I'm also a family farmer. My family and I run a 35 hectare farm here in Southern Denmark. And like thousands of farmers across the EU, that doesn't pay the bills. Uh, I wish it would, and that farmers were paid fairly for the food that they produce. We are now transitioning to a highly productive new system called agroforestry. It's a polyculture system, which can be supported by the Common Agricultural Policy. There are now many other funding opportunities for regenerative agriculture. Our main concern, and that of many of our neighbors here, is that we will require more workers than there are right now in agriculture. So we need a generational shift to lower the average age of farmers in the EU. And this generational shift, in, to put it in very simple terms, includes that we make jobs in agriculture cool again. And this is part of what regenerative agriculture, what nature restoration does. It is a necessary generational shift. Thank you very much again for the opportunity. Thank you so much, Tim, and, and thank you for that, that personal story as well. I think it just really demonstrates another aspect of the debate. 
Um, I think, uh, and I'd like to pass the, the floor to Elizabeth. Elizabeth Hoffman is the head of EU affairs at, at Valex, which has a, it's a company that you, many of you know well because of you know, your own homes, but uh, you have a 1.5 degree aligned science-based climate target, but you also work with WWF and others on forest protection, on restoration. So we see that you have a systemic approach to nature, people and climate, but it'd be great to hear a bit more from you about how you're working with your value chains, what the key challenges are for your company in implementing these nature and climate objectives and, and you know, how the, the nature restoration law could be important in supporting that transition. Thank you. Thanks so much, Ursula. Um, yes, thanks for having me join that very uh, timely discussion today. Um, so a few words about Velox in case you don't know who we are, global uh, market leader in roof windows, and we always say that we bring or create better indoor environment. Um, and I'd really like to bring the perspective of the construction sector because a lot of the focus, for obvious reasons, is on agriculture, uh, also at the event today. And um, so for us, nature restoration is, is critical. And we also think that we actually need to go a step even further and start mainstreaming nature protection in EU legislation to really align the objectives that we have on growth with climate and also with, uh, with nature. Now, I come from a sector that is um, rather slow uh, to change to, to long-term investments. We're not a fast consumer product. Um, so changing the status quo is not something that is happening overnight. But at the same time, we know that we have to take action because 50% of global raw materials extraction actually goes into the built environment. And we are also responsible for one third of overall waste that is being uh, generated. And that is only going to further increase given the need to renovate our buildings to meet our climate objectives, but also to improve uh, living conditions. So the key question for us as a company is really how can we reduce our CO2 emissions, <clears throat> also deliver on the much needed renovation wave, and also at the same time protect uh, nature. Now many argue, especially this week, uh, that the nature restoration law doesn't come at the right time, that it's too much, that it's too fast, that it's too soon, which is actually also an argument I hear often when talking about the energy performance of buildings uh, directive. And so on the contrary, we think that we need these legislations now to send a clear signal um, that the business as usual approach no longer works and that we need to think about new business models and also about partnerships along the value chain. Um, because also at Velux, our focus has been mostly on the impact on climate in our value chain. Um, we've also now started to better understand the impact on nature and where we can make a real uh, difference, but we're still at the beginning. And I would like to highlight just a few of the things, Ursula, that you touched upon. Mm -hmm. um, so by 2030, we've committed ourselves to reduce our scope one and two emissions by 100% and to halve our value chain emissions. And that's really where the challenge lies because that's where 98% of our CO2 emissions are. And most of it is linked to the materials that we use. So the shift to low carbon and, where possible, secondary and recycled materials is really critical uh, for us. And that's where we need other companies in our value chain to go with us because alone we cannot uh, achieve that. Uh, and that's why we recently started uh, a few partnerships uh, along our value chain to actually get access to low carbon and recycled aluminium and steel. That's just the start, uh, but more has to happen in, in that regard. And then in addition to our future uh, CO2 emissions, we also committed ourselves to, to capture the equivalent of our historical uh, CO2 emissions by 2041. And we're doing that uh, through a 20-year partnership with WWF, uh, investing in forest uh, conservation projects um, in tropical uh, landscapes which have a high biodiversity um, value. Um, all of the carbon that is being captured is donated to the host country, so there's no offsetting involved. This is just for past uh, emissions. And I'm aware that this is not a nature restoration project in Europe, uh, but still I think some of the learnings that we had there may be helpful also for the discussion we're having here now. Because forest projects in um, the name of climate mitigation have done a lot of harm uh, in the past, maybe sometimes more than good because the focus was too narrow, focused on just carbon credits and disregarding biodiversity. So, so a clear strategic framework to enable action is important because there is a lot of companies that want to take action, 
but uh, they have not done so because of the complexity and also the reputational risk that is actually involved. Because from a company perspective, these projects are really high risk because there's high costs involved. It's a long-term nature. And there's also this uncertainty of actually working with nature because that's not our common, let's say, home turf, what we're used to doing. And that's where, where we think the nature restoration law can really uh, make a difference. And, and finally, just going to the construction sector, like we've also worked for decades to actually try to show that we need to move more towards sustainable buildings um, and really start rethinking how we design and build. Because we often hear the argument that it's simply too expensive and that we cannot do it now. And so we just finished uh, the construction of living places, which is like a, a building prototype in Copenhagen, to showcase that with the technologies that we have today, we can actually build energy efficient, decarbonized and healthy buildings, which are scalable and also affordable. So to basically show that things are possible and we need to stop like saying that, um, yes, we need more time. I end here. Thank you so much, Elizabeth. Um, and nicely on time as well. So, yes. Um, thank you. And I think now we'd love to hear as well from Bart Van Watera, who's the, the Vice President for Corporate Communications and Government Relations at, at Nestle, <laughs> and to understand a bit better the journey that you have had in promoting regenerative agriculture and restoring nature, and some really exciting lessons from the models that you've, you've done in terms of how this can be replicated and, and understood in terms of implementing the nature restoration law. So it would be great to hear a bit more about your practices on nature restoration and, and how you believe it could in, increase the resilience of the food sector. Thank you, Ursula. Um, so no need to introduce Nestle. So I, I would say we depend 100% on nature huh, uh, for our uh, raw materials. So mean nature under pressure, we are under pressure. That's very clear. I would say look to coffee. Um, if we don't intervene in um, 25 years from here, we will only have half of the area where we cultivate coffee now uh, will no longer be suitable. Huh? So that's quite, quite impressive. So, and then you know that two thirds of our impact in our supply chain on climate, on biodiversity comes from um, our agricultural ingredients. So basically you have the two sides, <laughs> the victim and the contributor. And so this is why, and Pascal Canfin was saying, okay, the company should take action. Exactly. Uh, net zero, we, we take the net zero uh, commitment and we are very much open to um, these market driven mechanisms that he was also uh, mentioning. Um, what is very clear, if we want to achieve net zero, we will have to restore and regenerate the nature. That's very, very clear. Otherwise, it's a no-go. It will have to be done with those nature-based solutions. Stefania, you mentioned many of them already, and also with new technology. Huh? Um, both of them will need to work for the nature and will need to work for the farmer. Um, first, maybe the farmer. Um, I think we will fail if we don't have the farmer with us. We see what's happening here, politically speaking. If we impose things on them, uh, it will go wrong. I think we as humans, we have imposed many things on nature. It went also wrong. So I think let's not forget this lesson. This is the reason why regenerative agriculture is so important, because we believe that is the middle ground. Because with regenerative agriculture, you can keep your business, your farming business successful, mm -hmm. for sure. We have proof. I will give you some examples. And secondly, it's the way how you restore nature. Mm -hmm. So you have those two wins in one go huh? with all the co-benefits. Um, in practice, one example, a farmer uh, that I uh, came across uh, is part of our wheat program. So for our breakfast cereals. Uh, basically, he embarked seven years ago on the program. Actually, I have to say he was forced to embark on it because he realized uh, that uh, he was confronted with black grass. I don't know if there are experts here, but basically black grass is really uh, an enemy of cereal production. Uh, so if you, but then he realized that with pesticides, 40 of them are completely resistant. So he cannot fight any more black grass. So he needs to do it with nature and not against nature. So basically he onboarded with us, uh, with our agronomists, we have some 5,000 uh, all over the world and then through our suppliers, many, many more. So we basically looked with him 
what can work here on your farm? What can you do? Which of the practices that we know, cover crops, rotation, all these kind of things, intercropping, what can really work for you? And so we tested, he's seven years. The disadvantage of agriculture is, let's not forget, you have one chance a year, huh? uh, basically. So he got seven tries. He has now a successful business. He realized that he's using much less pesticides, much less fossil fuel inputs. <laughs> and so it's not only successful in terms of productivity, but also in terms of profitability. And that's also quite interesting because that's what you want, no? Um, examples like, like, like this farmer we have everywhere now in, in Europe. France is a very important country for us because we get a lot of raw materials from there. So we, double, we will double the hectares uh, this year from 15,000 to 30,000 hectares where we have regenerative agriculture. We should go to 20% already there. We want 20% from regenerative agriculture in 2025, <coughs> half by 2030. We are at seven today. So. Mm. Still a lot to do. I think nature restoration law would come in very positively to accelerate uh, the uptake of regenerative agriculture. And finally, I would say, and this is the learning also from working with the farmers, productivity goes a little down or there is a risk for it to go down in the first years. And this is where we need to help, where we need to support. We can do it as privates. But we, we don't own all the supply chains. I mean, we are rather small. So in the end, we need also to think the public money that we have, how it can be used. And if I look at the US in the um, era, we talk a lot about era, uh, 20 billion is going to regenerative agriculture. In Europe, we have this uh, industrial plan. There's nothing. It's clean tech. But where is the resistance in the politicians? It's in agriculture. Let's, let's think about it. We, I think we did it wrong. We, we think we, keep, we try to keep the clean tech industry here, but we didn't, didn't think about the farmers and how we transitioned them. So ultimately, what we did with Food Drink Europe, our um, organization of the food manufacturers and drink manufacturers, we said, let's think for the next commission on a plan that accompanies all these legislations mm. to basically build a food investment and resilience plan. That comes on top because we have to say it. The cap is income support. And they will fight till the end. By the way, I'm a farmer's son, and my brother and my sister are. They want huh, to keep that money for income support. We will have to find a way, just like the US, to bring in new money and really to say, your first three years, when you transition, how you, you have this money. We cover the risk for you. And then we will transition. And then you don't need any more that money. Uh, and I think that's very important. We have forgotten that, unfortunately, but it doesn't mean that we need to throw the baby away with the nature restoration law. We need it, mm -hmm. but we also need the accompanying measures. Thank you so much, Bert. Um, so in fact, yeah, a, a lot of um, family uh, history with farming as well. And I think this is one of the personal parts of this, this law. I mean, all of us are connected somehow to nature and to farming as well. Um, so I th we've heard from a technology company, we've heard from a company engaged a lot in energy efficiency and, and, the, and also in the food sector, but, but now I think it'd be great to hear from the renewable sector um, and, and from Paul, who is going to talk to us a bit about the work that Euroelectric has been doing. I mean, in a recent letter uh, with the Nature Conservancy, you explained about the complementarity between the challenges, that the importance of how you balance or how you work together on accelerated renewable deployment uh, alongside the EU's nature restoration objectives. So it would be great to hear a bit more about this from you because, I mean, of course, we've also heard about some of the challenges, but it'd be great to hear a bit more about the complementarity. And I'm sorry, I think we, we couldn't show the slide. There was some no issues with the, the streaming, but um, please, yes, go ahead. Uh, Thanks Paul. a lot, Ursula, for the introduction. And uh, yes, I'm Paul from Your Electric. We are representing the power utilities, the electricity utilities, of Europe, and uh, not only renewables, we represent all technologies, but of course, um, renewables are at the forefront on the biodiversity debate, of course, because there's so many of them installed right now. Um, so yeah, I think I'm one of the few here, maybe from the power sector, but we are both maybe cause and cure of, of climate policy controversies. Uh, 
in the past we were polluting and now we are decarbonizing and uh, electrifying. So uh, just also to bear in mind as a backdrop, the biodiversity crisis is mainly triggered by climate change. Mm. So if we don't tackle climate change seriously, we can do whatever we want. Biodiversity will be at loss. So that's why it's so important for us to, to create this complementarity, as you said, Ursula. So this is, uh, this is also important to bear in mind um, uh, about the dimensions of, mm. of decarbonized power production that we are about to, to install if we are serious about tackling climate change. So um, it is, if you look on only a 2030 uh, perspective, it is only uh, seven or only, it is over 700 gigawatts of new installations of wind and solar, new and most of it is not somehow in industrial areas or anything, but really out there. So these are just two, uh, two technologies I'm pointing out here, but there will be a lot and there will be conflicts and there will be social acceptance and there will be biodiversity debates and all of that around it. So we need to be, uh, we need to be aware that if we don't tackle this constructively, the climate and the energy transition is not going to happen by 2030 already. We can forget about it. So that's why this complementarity is so important. And there is a lot of good practices already out there. And uh, it's good to give some examples, I believe. So uh, just take one technology which is, which is really growing exponentially, which is offshore wind, for example. Uh, one measure that is, uh, and that just came away doing it uh, effectively, is if you have offshore wind farms, you are increasing biodiversity because uh, they serve as an artificial reef for many, you know, fish and uh, and mar maritime species that would otherwise be gone uh, from the area. So it it serves uh, it serves as a refugee area for juvenile fish as well. Mm. This all has been discovered on the go, basically. Nobody has really planned it, you know. But it's important to um, to point this out as project developers, and also important communication is so important with the relevant stakeholders. I believe there's a lot of policies out there that we are trying to implement with good intentions, but we don't communicate properly. Mm. Uh, if we don't involve the stakeholders affected in the area, in the communities, and be transparent and, and inclusive about the project, about its consequences, good or bad, uh, this is where the penny will drop. Uh, we are just living in a world that is quite populistic right now with lots of alternative facts. So we need to face this. And this is probably also something that Mr. Confer and Luena are currently facing, you know. So just to be sure, we are absolutely in favor of the nature restoration law and we would like it to go, well, you know, to happen basically. Mm -hmm. uh, where for us, the, the, the important uh, fact will lie in its implementation is basically that we have you know, coordinated approach between the uh, uh, national energy and climate plans at national level the uh, the renewables uh, acceleration areas that we have just uh, decided on in the renewables energy directive provision and the and the provisions of the of the restoration areas in the in the hopefully coming um, nature restoration law mm -hmm. so if this is coordinated and not working and kind of or played out against each other at national level this will be the right approach and again communication is key uh, if you look also you know at misconceptions that we have out there, we have over one million of artificial mm -hmm. barriers in our waterways, in our waters in, in Europe. Less than 10% are basically hydropower related. You know, I know hydropower is very much on the, on the front of, you know, controversy here. Um, so a lot can be done already without, uh, without yeah, kicking the, the baby out of the bathtub, as, as uh, the previous speaker said. Uh, I'm mentioning hydropower because it is actually a renewable technology and it has this wonderful characteristic to be actually predictable and, you know, dispatchable, as we would say in the power sector. So you can always use it. You don't have to wait and hope for wind and sun to shine or to blow. So uh, this, is, this is important to point out. And um, so let's make this... Um, as nature restoration uh, law work in an inclusive way, also together with the other legislation that we have in in the pipeline or just about to be to be passed at, at European level, and then it can work. Then we can do climate change, energy transition, and nature restoration together. If you pick one out, it won't. Thank you. Thank you so much, Paul. Um, Ariel, um, so I know you've been patiently sitting here through a, a while now, and I know it's you know you've had a Quite a busy period of 
period recently. So thank you so much for joining us. Ariel Bruno is the director at BirdLife Europe and Central Asia. So it'd be great to hear from your perspective. I mean, having listened to this discussion, to lay out your expectations and your thoughts based on this. Well, I think that uh, what we've heard so far makes the picture uh, very, very clear. Uh, we have here a very clear choice between, on the one hand, uh, the policy of fear and division mm. and a policy of hope and a positive project for the future. And we cannot allow the politics of fear and conflict and division to win. Mm. Because, well, first of all, there is a, a, a moral issue there. The, the living world is dying around us and the science is very clear Another study came out just a couple of days ago about the half a, uh, half a billion birds that have been lost and pinpoints it to intensive agriculture in a very, very clear way. So there is no doubt about what is happening out there. Mm. Um, but even for those people who do not have that sense of morality mm. to think that a world with no birds and with no butterflies is not really a world worth, worth living in, and that we have a sense of responsibility. It's actually quite shocking that, uh, you know, the EPP should maybe go back to their base and listen to people like the Pope and listen to, you know, what are the values that in theory are supposed to underpin uh, their works? Because some of the, of the kind of uh, moral, including religious leaders, are saying very clear things. But even if you really don't care with, about that level of deeper morality, just in terms of survival of mm. Europeans in this century, whether it's individually mm. or as societies, including businesses, we are not going to survive it without dealing with this twin challenge of climate change and biodiversity. And the idea, we've heard some politicians saying, oh, well, we should give priority to uh, climate now. You cannot go to net zero without nature. People have said it. It just doesn't work. The numbers don't add up. Mm. Now, we will need to do all of this stuff. There is no option of not doing it. The only question is, how many people are we ready to kill before we do what we all know needs to be done? And the second question is, are we going to do it together as Europeans in a way that allows us to minimize conflicts and optimize the synergies, or will we do it in a piecemeal way, which will be heavily suboptimal? Those are the two questions. So very, uh, very concretely, uh, there is an issue of EU example in the international scene. You cannot credibly ask Indonesia or Brazil to keep vast areas of their land under tropical forest if we here are not ready to even give nature field margins. Mm -hmm. Nobody will believe it. Food security. We will have some countries in Europe and some companies that will do what needs to be done. When you start losing, now we had last year 50% losses in things like maize production in vast regions of France and Italy. This year is likely to be worse. When you start having that kind of crop losses, food security will be on the line. And as long as you have a, a, a market functioning, nobody will be shielded. Of course, the poor people will suffer most, but it will be disrupting everything for everyone. Even if you have done all the right thing as a company or as a region or, or, or as a sector. Um, and farmers will be the ones that pay the highest price. Floods and storms and fires are already, look at what is happening in Italy at the moment. When the flood comes, it takes away everything. Look at what happened in this country two years ago. The floods that have destroyed cities here and in Germany were coming down from the drained peatlands that were drained for intensive forestry and, and intensive agriculture. If we don't reweight those areas, those floods will come ever more frequently and they will take away your factories, they will take away your businesses, they will take away your clients, and they will take away your sons and your daughters. It's that bad. Now, 
There is also a more positive agenda. There is a lot of people who want to invest in biodiversity. I've just spent the last few uh, weeks uh, in Scotland where uh, there are some really fantastic rewilding uh, projects that are funded by the private sector. Now, people want to spend the money, but they need a framework. Mm -hmm. Because if you don't have the framework, you will get more conflict. You will get people who want to do biodiversity or want to do carbon, and they will buy the land and the local community will hate it and so on. And it will be done without consultation and sectors will be outcompeted by other sectors and people will compete against each other. So we really, if we want to attract those uh, investments to Europe and attract them in a benign way and have good carbon projects that are not just Sitka spruce plantations that will all be blown up by the wind or will burn and all the carbon will go back where it came from, but will be robust carbon stocks, we need to do it properly from an ecological point of view. The restoration law is the opportunity and it won't come again quickly to create that framework where we can decide what we want to do, how to do it, consult people, put it on a map, and send very clear signals to the private market about where we want to go. And that will also allow us to do forward planning mm -hmm. on things like renewables, where we can look at places like the North Sea and say, where do we want to restore the ecosystems so that they also produce the fish that the fishermen mm -hmm. still keep fishing? Where do we want to fish? And where do we want to do the wind farms? And how do you make all of this uh, all together? It's a huge opportunity. It's on the line today. We need you to get your CEOs and your uh, presidents and whoever has a voice to call ministers, prime ministers, and members of parliament. Because at the moment, they are only hearing the voices of those very backward lobbies who are just afraid of change and keep scaremongering about the fact that any change is bad. Now, the sad thing is the change is already happening. Yeah. Ecological yeah. collapse and climate change are forcing the change. The only question is not about whether change will happen or not, or whether it will be fast and slow. It will be fast. The only question is, are we ready to govern the change, or are we going to just endure it? Thank you. Thank you very much, Ariel, for that passionate intervention. And I think really clear point about the, the real need and the opportunity in putting together the framework. Um, I, I am conscious we're running slightly over time. I believe we have a bit more time in the room. So if you have a little bit of patience, we could go quickly to a response from the shift and then we could take a few questions before uh, finishing up with the concluding remarks. So um, I'm very glad to have Bart Korain here from The Shift, with, um, and he would, he's going to provide a perspective from uh, his network on these topics. So go ahead. Thank you very much for this uh, interesting debate and a number of viewpoints. Uh, so I'm indeed, I work for The Shift. We're a non-profit uh, network around sustainability. We have about uh, 500 members, two of whom are uh, even in, in the debate. At The Shift, I'm responsible for our biodiversity program, and um, I would like to share some, some observations, uh, what we've seen there. When we launched this about four or five years ago, it was really difficult or, or quite difficult to get our members' attention to this topic. This has changed dramatically in the past two years. It's now rising really to the top of the sustainability agenda of a number of our members a lot faster than, than we thought. And in my opinion, there, there's a few reasons for that. First of all, a number of our member companies are realizing that nature is a material issue for them, very material, be it for the security of their assets, be it for the resilience of their supply chain. It is simply impossible to grow a number of products if the right environmental conditions are not met. Secondly, there is for those companies an increasing pressure also from stakeholders. And I'm not referring, even though they, they are obviously a stakeholder as well, I'm not referring to the usual suspects such as environmental groups, but investors are really taking a look at this. In a recent survey among 300 institutional investors, more than half indicated that 
by 2030, biodiversity will be one of their top topics in their investment policy. So it is on their agenda as well. And thirdly, and that point has been made several times here, companies do realize that the climate crisis and the biodiversity crisis cannot be solved independently. More than 50% of man-made greenhouse gas emissions are absorbed by nature. That's a huge number, and it's, it's an easy solution in, in a certain way. Yeah? So to come back to, to the core topic of this meeting, I think the EU nature restoration law really reinforces and, and complements the work what, what businesses are doing and, and gives a strong signal that nature should be really taken into account in, in business decisions as well. Thank you so much, but I don't know if there's any questions in the room. Um, I, I know that there's been quite a lively debate in the chat online in the meantime. Um, and uh, one, of the, one of the questions really is a bit about how do we support farmers through the transition? You know, what is the funding frameworks? How do we do this? I mean, we know that overall the, the investment benefits are huge, but of course, if you're a farmer in the short term, maybe there could be some other aspects. So maybe I can ask Carolina if you have any views on this or if anyone else would like to, to come in on, on that point. But perhaps if I start with uh, Carolina, that would be great. And in the meantime, I'll pick up, if there are questions in the room, I'm happy to pick them up afterwards. Well, I'm not sure I'm the right person to answer on that specific question. Uh, for, for the nature restoration law, um, in terms of financial support, we have not provided any specific provisions. This law basically, at, as it stands now, relies on the, the available financing tools uh, that are there, including the CAP, the Common Agricultural Policy. Uh, so uh, the support that is available to farmers through the CAP of course, can be then used also for nature, nature restoration, um, as well as also for foresters, for fishermen. Uh, <coughs> I mean, um, so, so these are the, the, the mechanisms that there are, but obviously then the devil is in detail. CAP is also a very high level sort of policy. Uh, then the implementation boils down to how it's done on the national level, on the local level. And we know, um, I don't want to now go into the debate about whether CAP or not should be reformed, etc. <laughs> it's a whole new story, but uh, we know that it's maybe not optimal uh, for, for, to reflect um, the transition that needs to be done. Um, it needs to look at the whole chain. Uh, probably we need to, 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 to have a, um, a bit of a thinking on how... Um, how to better um, accommodate all these challenges. And farmers are under a lot of pressure. It, it can't be that you know, they, they get a fraction of the price for the kilo of whatever produce they produce uh, and that the consumer then pays. So where, where does all this money go? And some should also be then um, returned you know, to, 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 to maintain the, the, the ecosystem services. Um, but it's, it's a very complex uh, matter. As the environment, of course, we always try to influence as much as we can um, the, the, the possibilities to green the cap. But uh, for the time being, we have these two. And there are options there. There are opportunities there that can be exploited if cap is implemented in the right way. And there I also would like to add just very briefly that it's not like, you know, member states have to prepare these CAP strategic plans where they basically program how the money will be spent. And they are reviewed on, uh, later on, you know, on regular intervals. So we keep advocating, like, do it. Just take this money also for restoration because it can be done, but it needs the right in in incentives as well. Thank you, Carolina. I think maybe we'll go quickly to Bart and then to Ariel, and then uh, perhaps we can wind up. I know. No, very much in agreement with uh, Carolina. Um, I think they, they deserve support. Huh? There is support in CAP, you could say. Um, nevertheless, I think in retrospective, if we would have done this maybe in a better way, we could have, with the farm-to-fork strategy, have started with the framework, laying down the framework, the food systems law, 
should have been there in the first place, defining what are the gaps, what we need to close, what are the accompanying measures, how we are going to use the cap, and things like that. And if not, if we cannot use the cap, how we are going to put additional pockets of money specifically directed at this. Because now we have what we call eco-schemes, and I think, Ariel, you did fantastic studies on that. Well, they are not helping too much because there is like one practice, check the box, and you get the money. But you don't do regenerative agriculture with that. So this is why I was saying European Union should certainly look at a more holistic approach on this. Like the US is actually starting in a different way. They put the incentives and they will see how it will, will get used there. And there is, um, I heard there is thousands of people that they recruit in the US government and locally just to make sure that the money that they put the 20 billion there will land with the farmers that are doing this. So this is completely different than the way how we are doing it with the national strategic plans. So I think let's review that as fast as possible. Now we are late in the term, so as I said, Let's do what we have. Let's build a nature restoration law. But we need to look at the enablement and the investment for the farmers as well. Thank you. And uh, Ariel, go ahead. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, first of all, it's quite striking that it's the same MEPs that voted yesterday to kill the restoration law who killed cap reform two years ago. So there is a very cynical game to be played here, that is being played here, where first you prevent the use of CAP for change in agriculture, and then you say, oh, we cannot change anything because the poor farmers need help. Who prevented them from having help? And behind that, there is the fact, there is a lot of money going into agriculture. It's that 80% of it goes to 20% of the farmers. A third go to 1% of the farmers. And it's typically not the ones doing the right things and not the ones trying to change. Now, this is a political choice of the member states. Now, there is a silver lining there. Under the current CAP, member states are allowed to do with cap money whatever they want, whatever they want. And the Commission has approved anything. So they can also change it every year. So let's pass a law that at least sets up what are the changes that we need, and that will give an incentive to agricultural authorities to start using the money instead of wasting the money, which is what they are doing at the moment. That's one answer. The second answer is that there is a lot of market coming from the market that wants to go into biodiversity conservation and carbon stocks. Let's give it a framework, and then at least we'll make the most out of this market money, which will go to farmers and foresters. Mm -hmm. And the third thing, there is a case for EU spending dedicated, we need a restoration fund. Now, that's why we do want to see in this law, the Commission did it, propose it, but let's amend it, Parliament and Council can do it, put in uh, a, a paragraph that requires EU co-funding, and that would be a hook in the next EU budget debate for creating a proper ecosystem fund, which makes a lot of sense. So, again, the solution is to make things happen not to just break everything and sit down and then say it's broken. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, I, I'm conscious that we are quite over time, but I, I think I'd love to bring in Gonzalo Sanz de Miera, who's the president of the, the Spanish Green Growth Group, who has been patiently you know, following this uh, discussion uh, from, from Spain. So it would be, be wonderful to have your, your concluding remarks um, and maybe keep it to, to five minutes or so and then, and then we can wrap up and uh, perhaps have a, a final cup of coffee. But thank you so much, Gonzalo. Please go ahead. Okay, good morning from, from Madrid. Uh, thank you for inviting us and, and apologize for not being able to participate in, in person. The Spanish Green Growth Group is a leading business organization that gathers more than 50% of the Spanish stock market, including key actors, big actors, medium actors, and, and small companies across all sectors of the economy, energy, finance, transport, industry, wine. So the Spanish Green Growth Group has among its funding goals to adopt ambitious business approaches towards ecological transition, supporting EU 
nature and climate ambition and their alignment with the climate Paris Agreement and the biodiversity framework agreed on the at COP15 in, in Montreal. So in this context, I would like to take the opportunity to share with you three remarks. First, businesses require clarity and long-term policy signals to substantially investment required in this transition to a truly sustainable, competitive and resilient economy. Second, the legal proposal for a EU nature restoration law provides an important opportunity to promote a productive, resilient and healthy economy and society. From a productive perspective, nature restoration is not for us a net cost, but a unique opportunity. So investments in nature re restoration provides a return, an economic return, owing to a broader benefits delivered through ecosystem systems. Restoration improves ecosystem resilience, and ecosystem restoration can improve health, well-being, and quality of life for people. And the third remark is that an effective implementation of the nature restoration law will require an intense engagement of member states and local communities. So a local based perspective on the actions of benefits and, and a more agile administrative procedure, I think this is really important, is really important for the wide range of, pro of projects and initiative need to be developed. So, as a conclusion, for the Spanish Green World Group, the nature restoration law, well implemented, will make the EU economy more sustainable, more competitive and more resilient. Because there is no, from our perspective, there is no a sustainable economy without a sustainable environment. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Gonzalo, and thank you everybody for your patience today and um, for allowing us um, to provide a, a forum for businesses across sectors who rely on nature for their operations and to hear from um, our key experts in the room. We really have made a, a, a clear call, I think, to members of the parliament to continue negotiating this legislation and to see how we can work towards improving it for, for all involved. Um, so we'd like to remind about uh, the, the message or the, the letter that was signed by a lot of networks recently in centre to, to key decision makers. This is a really key opportunity to fill the gaps here. Um, and we hope that we can um, all work towards a really good outcome on this that can provide the framework that we need in the next few years. Um, I'd like to thank everybody uh, for, for, their, for attending and also again to Cesar Luena's uh, office for all their support. Um, Final message on an administrative note. I think we all have to leave together, so please leave with the assistance. <laughs> um, but thank you all for your, for your patience, and uh, we look forward to keeping up uh, the discussion in the next period. Thank you very much. Thank you.